Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Keith Whittier. I'm very pleased to be joined by Sean Ashmore. If you don't know who Sean is, you probably haven't watching any TV or any cinema because I swear this man has been working consistently for decades. And look at him. He still looks great. He, looks, he still looks like he just got out of high school, and I mean that as a compliment. Oh, Sean, thanks, Sean, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Happy so, to be here. So I want to start off with, with uh, one of your most recent projects, uh, Darkness Falls. Recently mm -hmm. had the opportunity to see it. Um, it was, it's a very entertaining film, somewhat dark film. Uh, tell, the good, tell the good people about Darkness Falls. So uh, the way you described it, I think, is perfect. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Darkness Falls is a film about, um, uh, my character name, his name is Jeff Anderson. Uh, he is an LAPD uh, detective. And this isn't spoilery because this happens right at the beginning of the film, but his wife is killed. Uh, and he's convinced that uh, it's made to look like a suicide, but he's convinced that someone has done this to his wife. So he goes down the rabbit hole. He spirals out, uh, neglects his life, neglects his young son, neglects his mother, um, and just goes down the rabbit hole to try to uh, avenge his wife. Um, and as he peels the layers back, um, on the investigation, his own investigation, not like a, like a, a traditional uh, sanctioned investigation, he starts to realize that there are more victims than, than even he knew. Um, so it's a dark film. Um, it's a, a thriller. It's a mystery. What I thought was interesting about it, um, because we've seen vengeance films before and, and thrillers like this, but uh, when I was talking to the director, Julian Seri, who's a, a French director, Parisian director, um, his take on the story is that it, yes, it's, it's all of those things. It's dark and it's a thriller and it's about vengeance, but also he saw it as a story, uh, about fathers and sons, uh, which hooked me immediately because I have a young son. I have a three-year-old at home, almost three. And, uh, you mentioned that I, that I look young, uh, at the beginning of the interview, but I, I, I'm now sort of at that age where I get to play fathers. Okay. Uh, so as I'm going through my own journey of fatherhood, I'm getting to play that on screen, which is kind of interesting and challenging. And that's what made it interesting to me. It's like our, our serial killer and his son, the antagonists, um, their relationship is mirrored in Jeff's relationship with his son. And the idea that what we teach our sons echoes. And, and that's, I think, a timely message for now in the world that we live in. But also, I thought it was very important to this story. Um, so that's kind of where I got hooked. And I think that's where this film differs from maybe traditional thrillers or just revenge films is sort of like the familial nature and this idea of, you know, what we do echoes not only in our own lives, but in the lives of our children. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many serious themes in this film. And obviously you've, you've, you've acted across a lot of different genres in your career, but the, the themes in this film were, were so heavy, especially how the movie opens. Did you find it difficult to shut off at the end of, uh, at the end of a shooting day? Um, I didn't actually. I, and uh, I think partly it was because it, it wasn't a very long shoot. It wasn't like this was like a four month shoot. So I had to live with, in this world with this character and that, tra that, that tragedy the whole time. But also I got to shoot in Los Angeles where I live. So I got to come home to my son and my wife every day. And that sort of brightened up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can't help but sort of turn that off when you come home and, and get to be with your loved ones and your family. Um, it really made me think about um, appreciating my family and the time we have and the tragedies that strike people. And again, as an actor, when you're playing a character like this, you can't help but think about the worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. So you go through that in your mind and as opposed to letting that consume me, I sort of try to then appreciate the great things that I, that I have in life, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. We're, we're, we're in a very interesting time right now with, uh, with the pandemic going on and how um, uh, theaters and, and studios are dealing with, dealing with film. Now, was this originally to be a theatrical released film and they had to, and they had to pivot or was it always looking at um, uh, a direct to video uh, on I, demand I, I, type? Again, it's it, when you make an independent film, it's it's like the um, the goal is always to have a theatrical release. And I believe that before this, there was a small theatrical release okay. um, and they had to pivot. That's my understanding. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's just what happens. It's always a bummer. I, I personally love to see a film with other people uh, on the big screen with the sound and everything. Yeah. That being said, I mean, I think we've all sort of experienced in the last couple months watching films at home 
and thoroughly enjoying them. Sometimes yeah. it's fun to just be able to like, okay, uh, for me anyways, my son's down. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to make plans. I just, you know, turn on my TV, find that movie that I'm in the mood for and just sit back and enjoy. So I'm hoping that, that people find Darkness Falls that way. And again, it's a dark film for a dark time, but like mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to go on a crazy, a crazy ride. And I think that's what this movie provides. No, absolutely. Um, you, you spoke about independent, about this film being an independent film. Um, from covering the, the Toronto International Film Festival for several years and having the opportunity of speaking to many filmmakers who are taking their, their projects to, to, to Netflix, for example, one of the right. things they always talk about is the level of freedom they have with, with their projects. As, uh, as a producer yourself, do you have a preference between uh, the independent route and, and working with some of the other, like some of the, like perhaps the bigger studios? I think there's, again, pros and cons, right? Okay. Um, but personally, specifically as an actor, I like independent film because you, you get to make the movie that you set out to make for the most, for the most part, right? For, for, for better or for worse. Um, but it tends to be less cooks in the kitchen. Once somebody, whether it's uh, an investor or several backers, pay for the movie and they sign off on the thing, you just go make that movie with your team, you know? And, and there's no oversight. Uh, and again, that can be bad if you're, you go down a bad direction. Sometimes it's good to have a studio or an executive or somebody that's overseeing to, to rein you in if ideas aren't working. But, um, and this is, again, it's, it's just a different system. But like even say, for example, in our television series, if you want to change a line on the day, if you're in the scene as an actor and you're working and the line's not working or the scene, you know, maybe we can change something. You have to go down this chain of command, like get it approved all the way down. And you basically just don't have time to do it. So you basically just have to shoot what was approved. And sometimes that's not best. Sometimes it doesn't work. On an independent film, like something like Anderson Falls, with the collaboration of our, our writer, Gilles, and the director, Julian, and our actors, we rewrote scenes. We cut a page of dialogue out with Gilles right there, our writer, because it just wasn't working. It wasn't playing. And we could have shot it and edited it out after the fact, but we saved ourselves hours of, of work and, and shooting stuff that just wasn't really working. And you feel that as a performance when it's dragging or it's not working, the whole scene can be affected because you're just, you're just like, oh God, this isn't working. As opposed to like, let's just cut that paragraph and, and we'll all feel better about how the scene goes. So again, pros and cons, I like working on smaller projects because I like just being in there. I like being creative. I like um, being collaborative with filmmakers on the day in the moment. And that's something that you can sometimes miss on, on bigger projects. Okay, fair. Now, um, I touched on this earlier. Um, you have had this like this plethora of riches with your career in terms of working consistently. It's hard to, it's hard to find any gaps in where you weren't working. Um, yeah. what, what, what do you, what do you attribute that to? I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're a very, you're a very strong actor. So we have to, we have to acknowledge that fact, but you've also done a really good job of picking, uh, of picking some, some, some great projects. Um, so what, what is it that you, I'm not trying to make you feel old by any means, but what do you attribute no, your, no. Your, your longevity to? Yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, again, I'm 40 and I started acting professionally when I was 10. So it is a long time. It's decades. And um, I'm very proud of that. I think a big part of it is transitioning from different stages of life, like from a teenager to someone that to college age to into your mid 20s and then into manhood, essentially, like as you as you grow. Those are difficult times. And those have been the times where I've had the most trouble getting work. Be, and mostly it's, it has nothing to do with ability or your willingness to, to change. It's just like people and audiences and casting directors and producers and directors, they only see you for what you have done and not what you can do. Um, so you have to prove like, okay, I'm willing to step up now and like, I can play a father. Well, we've never seen him play a father. Well, that's because no one's given him the opportunity to like, you know, so there, there's those moments where you have to sort of prove yourself again and show whoever it may be, the, the decision makers, that you can play that role that they've never seen you play. Um, and as far as, you know, you said, oh, you've chosen some good projects. It's like, it, most of the time, it doesn't feel like you're choosing. It's like you just take the best opportunity that's presented to you at the time. And there have been times where I've been frustrated with the opportunities I've gotten. You know, I, either I didn't feel really strong about them, but then you make them and you end up feeling really good about them, you know? So I feel like it's just about taking 
and being appreciative of the opportunities you have and just trying to ideally play a character or be part of projects that you would watch yourself. Like that's, that's what I think about it. What, what would I want to watch? And I know that immediately when I read a script, I'm like, I would watch that movie. Who knows if it's going to turn out well, but just the story, the character, the pieces, the people that, uh, that are together when you, when you sign on, it's like, that's a team or a script or a character that, I would like to see on screen. And so I just try to jump in, but you never know how it's going to work out. Sometimes I've been a part of stuff where I'm like, ah, I don't know if it's going to work out. And I'm so happy with it. Other times you're like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And then you watch the final movie and it's like, that's not what I imagined at all. It's, it's like, it is like capturing lightning in a bottle. You never know until all the pieces come together and you're shooting it and then it's edited and the score comes and you watch it for the first time, whether it's what you wanted it to be or not. I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of actors about this. Are you able to watch your own stuff or do you have challenges like watching yourself? I am now. It took me years and years and years to be comfortable doing that. I tend right. to try to uh, give as much distance from shooting the film to watching it. And I don't, it's not like I watch my movies all the time, uh, I, but I, I can watch them now and not cringe. But it's better if uh, I watch it in its final state, like not rough okay. cuts on it. Directors are like, hey, I really want you to see a rough cut. You know, the, the music's not finalized and the color timing's not done. And I'm like, no, I want to see it the way that an audience will see it because then I can really judge how, it's, how it looks. Um, but it just took me a lot of years to be comfortable seeing myself on screen. And I look at it now like self-analysis and self-reflection. It's like, what's really interesting as an actor is sometimes you think you're doing something. Okay, I, I'm, play, I, I'm making a choice to play the scene like this. And then you, when you watch it, that's, it doesn't come across like that at all. And it's like this kind of disconnect that sometimes what you're feeling isn't necessarily um, broadcasted to the audience. So I've learned to sort of make adjustments. Like, okay, I think when I'm doing this, it's gonna come off like that, but it doesn't. So I need to <laughs> pick, make an adjustment. And it's weird. It's like, it's like saying like, well, when I wanna move my finger, I'll move my finger. But when you watch it on screen, you're trying to move this finger, but your thumb moves. Like, it's just, it's almost like what the way that you imagine it is not the way that it comes across. And so by, knowing what I was trying to do on the day and then seeing how sometimes how it comes across on screen, I can sort of make adjustments or be like, Oh, that really worked. That approach worked. Or uh, I would try it differently. So to me, I, I try to use it as, um, yeah, like self analysis and, and figuring out what works and what doesn't. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, but you know, you don't, you're not happy with the way it comes out or it doesn't work for you, but w the moments where it does work, you know, feel, feel amazing. When I watch a scene and I'm like, wow, I'm really happy with how that came out. It's, it feels great. Yeah, you gotta go through a lot of scenes that you don't feel great about to get those, but uh, I think it's worth it. Yeah, sometimes you have to put yourself in those uncomfortable situations to, 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 to make something stronger. I get that. Um, yeah. And, and looking, again, looking at the resume, I mean, you've had a lot of fantastic films, but also a lot of great television shows that have run for 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 a while um is it kind of the same in terms of if i was to ask you is there is there a preference between between film and and and, t and tv series is there one that you can say you identify or is it kind of mm. uh, the pros and cons of, of both i think my dream was always to make films okay um i i think mostly because when i started acting you know film was considered like the the peak you know what i mean like tv was great everybody watched tv and liked it but it seemed like um, that film was like the, the, the pinnacle that you want to get to, to make, to make cool films. Yeah. Obviously now it's like, you know, a new golden age of television and, and some of the best writers, talents, directors are on television. So I feel like that's shifted a little bit. That being said, um, what I enjoy about, there's, I get, there's two sides of it. I love film because you jump into a character, you immerse yourself with it. You only have two hours to tell the story, to, 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 impart this character onto an audience and then you're done. Okay. Like if you can't do it in two hours, you're never going to get to do it. And, and then you move on to the next thing. Um, that's fun. That's enjoyable. New character, new skills, new, you know, is he a doctor? Is he a ambulance? Uh, EMT? Is he a police officer? He's a lawyer. There's all these things, you know, do skills to get to learn when you're making films and you jump in and out of things. It's fun. Um, on the other side of that, I did a television series called the following, uh, that was on Fox that lasted for three seasons. We got 45 episodes to develop a character. And when the writing is good on television, you get to live a whole lifetime with this character, you know, like 45 hours screen time with, with the character is amazing. And you get to uh, experience uh, 
and an audience gets to experience all this time with them, uh, seeing them go through love interests, tragedies, joys, and it just keeps going and going and going. So that's kind of fun too, to, to constantly create this character and live with that character for a long time. That's hard to shut off. Like when you, uh, when the following was canceled and I was done playing that character, it did feel like I lost a little part of me because I spent so much time with that character. I'm like, wow, I never get to play that part again. I never get to have those scenes with Kevin and uh, with, with Jess, the people I was working with all the time. In, I mean, we may work together again at some point, but never in that context. And it was kind of like sad to lose that. So uh, pros and cons to both, I think. Yeah, just and not not pandering to you, but that was a a big hit in this household. I we really enjoyed the following. It's a oh, it's a, it's a shame that it's uh that it uh, that it that it uh, ended the way um, that it did. I'm glad you liked it. We yeah, I we, I had so much fun on that show. That was my first uh as an adult, I guess, uh, my first sort of regular television gig. And, I was going to say uh, what you're not counting your 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 uh your appearance on Cats and Dog. Well, no, I was no, I wasn't mean <laughs> on that. I was, uh, I was yeah, no, fair. That's yeah. Back. Well, I did a show called In a Heartbeat for the Disney Channel, and I did a show called Animorphs for Nickelodeon, but I was much younger. I was like a teenager. So this was yeah. like, um, you know, just a, a more recent sort of long-term gig. And um, yeah, it was, a f I loved every minute of it. I loved working in New York. I loved working with Kevin Bacon. Uh, I loved the team. Kevin Williamson and Marco Siega were two of the, the, the kind of top creative people that we worked with all the time. Amazing storytellers, amazing filmmakers. And it was just a great fun show super dark but we knew that and again that's one of those shows where people are like oh man it must have been so hard to make that show i was like i had fun every day making the show <laughs> like i it was just fun we had a great time we knew what show we were making we knew it was dark it was supposed to be kind of scary and sensational and we knew what we were doing and and so it was fun to make that show it's funny people always assume that if the show or the movie is very dark or serious the set must be as well and um often I, you know, it we, is there's, yeah. there's scenes, right? So I go, I got to break down and cry. It's like those, but I think because everything's so heavy, you find levity in it. And sometimes it's gallows humor, you know, like I've, uh, you know, you talk to professionals, doctors, ER doctors or EMTs. And it's like, they tend to have like a pretty dark sense of humor because you have to break the tension. You know, you're dealing with these intense life situations, life and death uh, all the time, people's pain, people's tragedy uh, constantly that you need to be able to break that tension. And so I'm not, trying to suggest that what we were doing was at that level, but yeah. you are sort of in an emotional state where everything's dark all the time. So I think that you instinct instinctively have to have fun and, and make moments of levity. Otherwise it would be heavy all the time. Yeah, no fair. Now, um, kind of piggybacking off of that question, kind of, I have a lot of followers, pun intended, um, <laughs> that are, uh, that are um, emerging actors, filmmakers here in Canada. And one of the, one of the things they're always looking at is to somebody like yourself who, you know, born and raised here in Canada, who's gone off and been tremendously successful. What sort of advice do you give to people who, who are in the industry? Um, it's hard. It's there's, I mean, it, that's a huge question, but you know, honestly, ideally, whether you're a filmmaker, whether you're an actor, whether you're a writer, um, make sure you love it. Make sure it's the only thing that you can picture yourself doing. Um, because even as a, an actor who has, I've made a living doing this for the majority of my career, there are scary times. There are times when I'm like, I don't know when my next job is. And again, I'm very lucky. I'm very, uh, it's very rare to sort of have that run that you're talking about. But I will go six months where I'm like, I don't know when the next paycheck is coming. So you have to be okay with that discomfort. And I still deal with it. I still, I still struggle with the uncertainty of this career. Um, it's really, really challenging. So be in love with it. Okay. And, um, and then just go for it. Especially if you're starting out, you have nothing to lose. There's nothing to lose. Do it. Do it as often as you can. Make a short film, do a play, do a class, write a script, send it to your friends, make contacts. You know, that's easier said than done, but like, just do it. You got to do it. Um, and again, I started young, so I, I feel like I always knew what I wanted to do. I knew at 15 years old that I was going to try to be an actor. Um, and I felt lucky that I had that purpose and that knowledge that I, that goal at a young age. Um, but I just did it. I was just doing it. I, I didn't play team sports. I missed out playing hockey with friends. I missed out doing, um, going to birthday parties and doing extracurricular activities because I was auditioning. 
my mom was driving me downtown. I was learning lines, uh, going to do this thing that I, that I knew that I loved. So you make a certain amount of sacrifice and hopefully that sacrifice, uh, the, the payoff, like you enjoy it enough that, you know, you know, sacrificing those normal things is, is worthwhile. So just love it and go for it. And that's it. And that's all anybody can really tell you, you know, like yeah. just plan. I don't think there can be a plan in this career as an artist. You just have to love it and go for it. And if you're lucky, it works out. And if it doesn't work out, you still have a passion and something that you love doing. You know what I mean? Like that's the worst case scenario is like, well, okay, I can't make my living doing this, but I can still participate and do this thing that I love, whether it's writing, whether it's performing, it's like, you can, you can do all those things. Um, and again, if you're very, very lucky, then, then you get to make a living at it. But that's all I can suggest to do is go for it. No, I appreciate that. And it's a, it's a valid point too, in terms of like predicting the future, because of course that staple interview question is, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, I don't know about you, but I mean, things change so quickly and so often. So you, I, I can't tell you where I'm going to be five minutes. You from know, now. exactly. So five years from now, I can tell you where I ideally would like to be, you know, continuing yeah. to uh, work and trying to be a great dad and, um, you know, working on projects that I enjoy, but, but who knows? Like you just, you just don't know. So that's what yeah. I would like. No, we'll see. Who knows what it's going to be. Um, quick question. Um, obviously you have a twin brother. Um, yeah. did you guys get into acting around the same time? We did. Um, so we were born in Richmond, British Columbia. Then we moved to St. Al St. Albert, Alberta. My dad's job moved us there and then to Toronto. But when we were in St. Albert, I always get the details of the story a little wrong because I don't remember it because we were so young, but essentially my mom was walking us uh, through the park and we were, I don't know, eight years old maybe. And a casting director said, Hey, would your boys be interested in auditioning for uh, a commercial? You know, we're looking for young kids to audition for a commercial. My mom was like, I don't know, kids, like, do you guys want to audition for a commercial? And we were like, well, what's it for? And she said it was a toy commercial. So <laughs> we auditioned. We were like, yeah, that sounds like fun. We get to go play with <laughs> Cool. Um, we auditioned. My brother got the role, but he was sick on the day. So okay. my mom brought me as well and was like, he's got the flu and he doesn't. But you hired the one that was sick. And they're like, okay, well, we'll take the guy that's not sick. So I got the job basically because Aaron was sick on the day, even though he got cast. Okay. And we started from there. But we also were, um, we always, uh, we took music lessons and classes. We sang in a choir in Edmonton when we were younger. So it just, it started out as just performing and being interested in the arts. My dad was always very into music. So that was kind of like how we bonded when we were young is like listening to music with my dad, you know, as record player. And I think that turned into piano lessons and singing and then acting. And, you know, here we are. So. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Now um, I want to ask you, um, obviously recently in the States, we have been um, all trying to put our, get our heads around, um, the, the unnecessary passing of, of George Floyd and yeah. the situation there. And of course that has um, um, launched a, a movement, if you will, globally that we've seen. Um, I wanted to get your take on, on, on what's been happening, uh, on what's been happening in the States and uh, I guess uh, all around, because I know here in Ottawa, we had a peaceful protest here this past Friday. It's launched a lot of different conversations in and around race. Um, I wanted to get your, uh, your, your, your take on, uh, on everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's obviously a, a huge discussion and a huge issue. And to be honest, the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to, um, I've been trying to listen and learn and also acknowledge that sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And so I've been lucky enough to have several, uh, friends of mine, who I've worked with over the years as actors or just become friends with, who have been very um, black actors, African-American actors that have been, I guess, um, kind enough to reach out to me to discuss. And it felt like very powerful and I felt very lucky to have friends that would engage in the conversation. And again, I sometimes I feel like I, don't know what to say. It's, it's, it's hard to watch so much pain and strife in the United States and in Canada and globally. So, I mean, I support everything that people are going through right now. I'm trying to figure out how to participate in the most um, helpful way. And for me right now, that's listening, 
to friends of mine that are expressing how they feel, what they need from me. And again, the most important thing for me is that I'm raising a son. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to impart the things that I do know and understand and the things that maybe I don't know and understand onto my son. So I'm just trying to pay attention so that the world that he grows up in and so that he can be an ally to people of color, to black people, to anybody that is being persecuted in our society. And it absolutely is happening. So it's, it's big. It's, it's hard for me to fully, I think, comprehend the pain and suffering that people are going through, but I'm just trying to pay attention right now. And I think that's what, what most people should be doing. Okay, thank you for that. Um, as we drift towards the end of this wonderful discussion, I wanna take you into a little something that has become very popular around these parts called rapid fire. Rapid I'm, fire. Going to, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Sean Ashmore, do you know any of the questions that I'm about to ask you? Zero, I have no idea. Okay, wonderful. Now, <laughs> now the first question, please do not be scared. You're, you're gonna be perfectly safe. Um, the first question I always ask people in rapid fire is what is your favorite movie of all time? And that is going to be the question I will ask you. But, I'm, but because you've done so many series, I'm going to ask you a two-parter. What's your favorite movie of all time and what's your favorite TV series of all time? The floor is yours. Lawrence of Arabia is my favorite movie of all time. Okay. Um, and my favorite television series of all time, uh, off the top of my head, I have two. Uh, Breaking Bad and um, from a sci-fi perspective, Fringe. It's like one of my favorite, favorite TV shows. Sean Ashmore, Breaking Bad is my favorite show of all time. I think we just became best friends. Okay. Yes, all right. <laughs> um, so you're, you obviously are, are, are a twin. And before I give you my next question, I want to give you this little factoid. There are uh, a set of twins in Australia who've been on the news multiple times. They're sisters. They have gotten to the point where they, they, they finish each other's sentences. They dress alike. They, I'm not sure if you've seen this in the news because they, they, they made headlines. Yeah, they, dr they dress alike. They eat the exact same portion so they look alike. They have the same like plastic surgery done. They are involved with the same guy because they want to get pregnant at the same time. I tell you all of this so I can say that whatever you answer to this question will not be as weird as that. What is okay. an interesting quirk with you and your brother? I, okay, hold on. I'm still, I'm still taking in some of the details. Like um, that is all factual. That's that's well documented. Check it out on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah. I, listen, I, I don't. I'm not judging. Yeah, and I absolutely believe it's possible. I just, I, I, I the thing is, I can't imagine trying wanting to be more identical because we have spent our entire lives trying to carve out our I, I, individual identities from yes. each other, and that's like a huge challenge. Um, a quirk. Oh man. Um, well, we both have the most, like the silliest, I think individual sense of humor, meaning like things that he think are hilarious, I think are hilarious, but nobody else in our lives seem to think it's funny. Like we can sit on the phone or FaceTime and just like riff on, okay, here's an example. Well, um, my brother, um, when, do you remember, you know Moana, that film Moana yeah, yeah. with the rock? Okay, so, we were both walking down the street one day in Toronto. This is like in front of uh, uh, Trinity Bellwoods. And there was a, a picture of uh, Maui from Moana. Uh, and we both saw that poster and we just thought it was hilarious. I was like, <laughs> I don't know why. We were like, The Rock is playing his character. It's hilarious. We just love the expression on his face. And we just laughed. We were like, dude, this poster is hilarious. It's awesome. Like, whatever. Now we love, uh, I love that movie. My son loves that movie. But he took a picture of that. Of, of of Maui's face he was just we were just like man it's like the animation cracked us up we thought it was hilarious <laughs> so but randomly like yeah. five five years later he'll just text me that picture and it'll pop up in my text thread and I'll just start laughing again I'm like I don't think anybody else in the world think finds it funny I have no idea why we thought it was funny it makes me laugh now it's just like it just is this thing that that tickled our funny bone together and no one else, I think, would ever thinks it's funny. But we're just like, that's a funny picture to me. I don't know why. So we have a goofy sense of humor that I think only the two of us really truly understand. And maybe it's a twin thing. I don't know. Maybe it's a brother thing. I don't know. But that's something that's kind of quirky. I like it. I like it. How does it feel having your own action figure? Of course, you've done a lot of work in the X-Men series. Yeah. Um, so how do, how, do, how do you feel having your own action figure? Do you, have them, do, you have them, do you have them like sprinkled around the house? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I do own several of them. I, you know, okay. I spent a lot of time 
uh, especially during the first couple X-Men movies, sort of, um, I guess, trying to brush off the, like, the, the, the merchandising of it. You know what I mean? Like, we were on, like, Dr. Pepper bottles. And, like, there was, like, a chic thing. So, like, I go to the grocery store and it was, like, Iceman and Pyro and Rogue on a razor package. And I was like, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, it's just kind of crazy. Um, and so I didn't collect any of that stuff. Now, as an older guy, and I was like, man, that was so cool. Like, what an opportunity. What a crazy thing. So I do have a few of the action figures. Uh, Animorphs, which was a Nickelodeon TV show I did. I have a couple of those action figures. I have a couple of action figures, I think, from X-Men 2. And there's this company, I think, called Toy Era that made, um, it's not licensed, so it's not like a Marvel product or a Fox product, but it's like, I think it's, a, I think it might be a Chinese company, but they made this like amazing Days of Futures Past, um, Iceman, Bobby Drake, um, like figure that's awesome like photo real like it looks just like me and someone sent it to me randomly you know i bought that i went on the website <laughs> and i bought that. i have that um nice. and that was like last year because i just thought man it's cool like this is cool to have these things and i don't have them on display but um i think it's more just like a bit of a time capsule and and as i get older and move a little farther away from that role i'm like man that was so crazy and so cool and i definitely appreciated it at the time but looking back it's like it's sort of like having a yearbook and being like, look what, look what I did. What, look what I got to do. Look at what, what other creative people did. Like make a, uh, an action figure out of, uh, out of a character I played with my likeness on it. Like it's, it is very cool. Like it's- Absolutely. My, 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 my kid, uh, the, the, my inner child like is, is excited about it. You know what I mean? Um, and the same thing, I've got, got to be a uh, part of a couple of video games. And like, that's almost cooler than watching yourself in a movie. Like actually getting to control yourself in a video game is, the ultimate cool, you know, grow, c coming from a kid that played like in television and then Nintendo and Sega Genesis and like all those old school systems to now turn on the Xbox and get to play a game that I'm actually in. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, st it's still very strange to think about. It doesn't feel real, surreal sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. We often hear about the, the wonderful treatment that, that celebrities can get. Have you ever been in a situation where you've said something to the effect of, by the way, did I mention an um, MTV Movie Award breakthrough winner? No. No, no. For, no that hasn't happened? No, but, okay. I, but I, will, I, will, I, will, I will say this. And again, um, I think my brother gets a real kick out of this. So um, years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were not married, actually. Uh, we... My, my parents were traveling around the South Pacific. They did uh, New Zealand and Australia and Fiji. And we were lucky enough to join them in Fiji. And as soon as I checked in to the hotel, it, we were like just getting impeccable service. Like just everybody was like very nice. And, oh, Mr. Ashmore, like, can we upgrade your room? Like all the stuff that you're just like, uh, absolutely. Like just like very spoiled. Okay. And I was just like, this is insane. And I, again, being... An actor, I was like, oh, they, they must be X-Men fans here. Like, wow, this is so good. Like, wow, I'm so lucky. And like, I was just like, wow, that's so cool. About two days into the trip, we had the television on and there was like a limited amount of stations. And I realized that Smallville is on like a loop there. And I was like, oh, they think I'm Aaron. They think I'm Jimmy Olsen from Smallville. They don't think it's me. They think I'm Aaron. And I, I didn't say anything, obviously. I enjoyed the perks and went along with it. But whenever someone asked to take a picture with Jimmy Olsen, I just was like, absolutely, and I smiled. So um, that, that's a true story that happened. And I thanked my brother uh, a lot after I got back for playing that role so that I got the perks uh, of him being Jimmy Olsen in Smallville. That is amazing. That is a, that is a perfect place to wrap up. Um, I want to thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. I hope you, you and your family continue to stay safe. Um, all the best with this, with this new film. Again, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish you all the best with it. And um, I know that you're just going to continue to, uh, to, to, to bring out great project after great project, as you've been doing, in your words, for decades. So thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, man.